Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, and in this video, we're going to be starting the restoration of something that I have been dying to start doing since I picked it up uh, well over a year ago, and that is this. <laughs> That's right! Oh. In these videos, I am starting, finally, the restoration of the IBM PC5150. Arguably, the machine that started the entire PC architecture that we know it, and that is still going to this day. I'm excited to start this because this is kind of a, it's a very historical computer, so I um, I want to do, I just want to get on to it. So, let's get into it and uh, see what kind of surprise we're going to find. Okay, so before I do turn to this, um, three things real quick. Um, the first one is, yes, I already opened this thing up and kind of got a look at some of the stuff that was in here. I didn't do a full teardown, just real quick, taking the cover off and seeing what what parts were in here during the uh, IBM Trio video that I did, uh, I think like a year and a half, two years ago now, where I picked up the 5150 here, the 5160, and the uh, previously restored 5170, which I did a couple videos on and a couple upgrade videos on as that as well. Uh, I'll put links to all those videos down below. Um, so I kind of already know what's roughly what's in here. I just didn't take a good look at it, and plus it's been a year. I've kind of forgotten some things already, so um, that'll be kind of a kind of refresher to see what's in here. The second thing is I'm going to be uh, splitting this up into two at least two videos maybe three just depends on what all is wrong with this machine because of the fact that i i even though nobody really mentioned it in the comments of that video of the 5170 restoration i kind of get this weird impression feeling when i was watching it back um much much later when i was trying to figure out some stuff that i did did in it i kind of feel like i rushed it and i didn't do a very good job of the full restoration i kind of cut out a bunch of parts and that kind of stuff so this is going to be a much more in-depth restoration um, which is why it's going to be basically split up into at least two parts. The first part's going to be me tearing this thing down, um, getting a game plan going, and maybe doing some cleaning to it. I don't know yet. Just depends on what all I decide to do with part one here. And then part two is going to be fully cleaning everything, getting everything reassembled, and then hopefully testing this thing, and then going from there. If there's any major problems, part three is going to be repairing stuff, and you know, whatever. Maybe part four if there's more problems than I'm thinking, or if it just flipping works, it's gonna be a two, maybe three part video. Serious, I, again, I don't know. The third thing is, yes, I sound a little bit off right now. I know I do. I'm coming down with something. I don't exactly know, I know what it is. I'm assuming it's allergies because, well, we had kind of a dust storm a while ago, and uh, as a result, I know I sound a little nasally. I wanna apologize for that, and I'm also gonna probably be cutting out a lot of, <sighs> That I'm going to be doing throughout the video, including any coughing or sniffling. So, if I miss one of those in the edits, I, I apologize. So, um, that's uh, well, first, I'm gonna grab my camera off the tripod and get a good look at the exterior of this thing so you know the cosmetic condition. And um, uh, then we're going to crack into it because I already removed the screws and put them up. So, yeah. So now that we got that looked through, let's take this top cover off. Oh yeah, okay. I remember this. I remember it now. That is a beefy, beefy top case. And uh, I want to point out something real quick. Uh, I posted a picture of this thing on uh, the Facebook page and a couple of the Facebook groups I'm in uh, that I was going to be starting the restoration soon. And uh, somebody posted a picture of a really cool clone case where it kind of splits right here. And the whole thing lifts up so you can swap cards in and out real quick. I thought that was really cool. I've never seen a case like that, and I'd kind of like to track one down. All right, so let's just start um, the full disassembly. By the way, I'm going to say this right now. I'm a little annoyed that uh, IBM chose to use flathead screwdrivers for this instead of the standard Phillips that we all know today. 
or Torx if you're compact. But, uh, you know, it's again, this there wasn't a standard before. So we have one very clean IO plate or IO bracket. And yes, this may be an excessive screw, size screwdriver for this, but um, first card here is the multi purpose card. I'll get a better picture of this here in a second. This looks like the RAM expander card with a bunch of jumpers, a bunch of switches, and a fully populated. RAM bank. And yes, it is missing the uh, the Varda battery that was here. I will explain that here in a, a little bit when I get to that point, but um, gotta do some research on it. Because I want to know exactly what this is, because this is either a, like, I don't know what, what RAM size these are. These are 4164s. I don't remember if I already talked about this. Didn't I already do some math and figure out this was uh, like 256 or 384, I think? Uh, I'll have to see exactly what this is. Let's figure out what the jumpers are. Which is kind of fun, because, you know, <laughs> Adrian over Adrian's digital basement has such a fun time trying to find any information on some of these obscure obscure expansion cards. God, if I could talk with being sick, the video card, which somebody removed those holy nuts, which I hate. But we have just a generic, uh, yeah, look at this. This is just a generic Hercules clone card. So somebody updated or upgraded the graphics in this. And the reason why I say that is because um, these things usually would have came with either the uh, MDA monochrome display adapter or the CGA color graphics adapt. Uh, like I said, I'll talk about this here in a second because I did get I did get some more information on this particular machine um, from the gentleman that I got it from. So I'll talk about that here in a second when I get it all torn apart with a weird blue cable. Yep, just a generic front of the mill. Oh, for a second there, for a second there, this little red ink spot right here on the edge made it look like it was burnt, but it's not. Oh, that scared the crap out of me. I was like, what burnt it? But yeah, just a box standard. Um, oh, we have a date on it. No, we don't. I'm, st I'm stupid. Uh, it just says 1684. Or maybe that's 16th week of 84? Maybe. Is there any date codes on any of the chips? Not that I can see. Nothing that's really sticking out. And now comes the interesting part is a hard drive controller. Now that's kind of interesting. And that kind of gives me a clue as to what exact model of 5150 this is. The original 5150 could not, the first revision of these, could not do externally booting devices. So EGA cards, VGA cards, hard drive controllers wouldn't work in the very early ones. So this is, I believe a revision three. I think revision three was the only one that accepted external booting ROMs like this. Uh, so we have a, I don't know if I talked about this in the trio video. We have a WD 100 2S WX2. Uh, looks like 30th week of 83 is the date code that's on there. Uh, there's a weird symbol, handwritten thing on that chip there. I'll see what that's about. Date code controller of 85. So this may have been added very late into its lifespan. <laughs> this is this is a janky way to hold in a hard drive. It's held in by one screw. There is, I'll get a picture of that, but look at the amount of washers on that to keep that hard drive locked into the slot. All right. So we have an MFM drive. We have a Seagate model ST213. I am going to say this right now. I am not holding my breath for this thing to work. It's a very nice half height drive. Somebody's been in here. Picture that later, but yeah, the warranty sticker's been ripped, which may explain uh, maybe what the guy I got this from was talking about. Actually, I'm gonna say that I really have high hopes that this thing is going to be made functional because not just from the historical standpoint of it, but from the fact that um, I already picked up a 5150 a long time ago. A single full height. Oh, this is a beefy boy. Oh my God. Uh, uh, Tandron uh, floppy drive. Ooh, there's some neat stickers on here. We have an audit sticker on here. Uh, we do have the official IBM branding. So this is an original drive. Uh, and God, the, the, the amount of like consolidation that's happened uh, over like 30 years from when this thing was originally built with these uh, drives all the way up to... Uh, current modern floppy drives is just a standing. It spins free. So it's a little dusty in there, but that mechanism works just fine. I will say I did watch a, uh, I don't know if it was a restoration video on the 5160 or if it was on a compact portable. The guy that was in the video, I don't remember what the video was right now, uh, was talking about these drives and these latches being extremely fragile. And that makes sense because that's almost the identical mechanism that was in, that's in my uh, Osborne that I, or Osborne, that I restored. Uh, God, I can, I can tell I sound sick. We have a production date of August 25th of 1983. So this floppy drive was sold or could have been used in the 5160 actually, because I think that was out in 1983. Now we're seeing some more dust. We got that really cool uh, blue floppy drive. I don't think I've seen a uh, cable. I don't think I've seen a, a blue one before. That's actually kind of neat. And actually, I'm kind of thinking about this. That would mean this is a drive. If that hard drive doesn't work, which I don't think it will, I will need to source a, another uh, floppy drive. Since I'm gonna be completely cleaning this thing, let's just remove the speaker in its entirety. We've got the very nice cone speaker. I really uh, love 
uh, when I come across these in like some old PC cases. Because the piezoelectric ones are fine for like just a little warning tone, but God, trying to find just the cone speaker so that you can have proper, better PC sound from like old DOS games. Man, just the engineering that went into this thing. So we have the IBM 5150 mainboard. I'm gonna get a better picture of this here pretty soon, but um, it's actually pretty clean. It's a little dusty. Um, there's something here I'm seeing that I'll get a better shot of here in a second. We have a fully populated RAM bank, which is good because this is a 64 to 256K uh, board. Take out the power supply here, which is a whopping 63.5 watts. Yeah, really makes you appreciate uh, or uh, wonder how inefficient a lot of these new PC hardware components are because it's like you have to run like a thousand watt CPU or PSU anymore to run your Ryzen and your RTXs and your things anymore. It's like, you know, this thing got by doing what it was doing with only 63 watts. Okay, I mean, yeah, you don't need the thousand watts for general purpose stuff, but you know, overkill is underrated, I guess. There we go. That is a beefy power supply for only for putting out about, uh, you know, just shy of 64 watt. That is beefy. Like I've got a thousand watt uh, power supply. It's an old one from like, I think 2009. It's an old one. I don't dare use it for anything. But I think even it is dorked by this. Oh my God, that is awesome. And a single cooling fan. And we have the uh, the chassis here, which is actually pretty clean. Like it's just, it's dusty, but I'll get some shots of it, but it's actually not too bad. In fact, it's even got all four of the original uh, original cork feet on it, which I'm gonna replace at some point. So, um, cool. So I wanna talk about this for a brief second because I did get some more information about this, uh, not just this machine, but the other two machines as well. Because when I went back to get the Amdeck 310A and that weird 720 in the back, 600 in the front, uh, Amdeck, uh, EJCG, whatever it was, uh, I kinda asked him about these machines. I wondered if he remembered anything about them. And he said, oh yeah. I do. He said that he, that I am where he was almost 25 years ago. He was into the idea of collecting old computers, restoring old computers, and putting them up in a museum style uh, environment so that people could see the evolution and um, progression of home computing. And he really wanted to make sure he found the original PC, the original XT, and the original AT, which he, he did obviously because i have them now but he just never had the time or the means to do so because he was always busy um so he was more than more than uh, happy to see that they were going to somebody that was going to be doing it the story he told me with these was he got them all from a bank uh sometime in the, i believe he said the late 90s or he believes the lightning late, late 90s so he told me he, his memory's a little fuzzy on it but not and he said basically the bank had to keep these things for several years and they were, they were kind of forgotten about and the main reason for that is because in financial world banks law offices um legal stuff if the business or most businesses too have to do this as well it's a it's kind of a law for like tax purposes if you buy a new computer and you replace an old computer it doesn't matter what computer it is you have to keep either that whole computer or the main the main hard drive archive it for five years inside the premises it's for tax purposes audit purposes legal things you know that kind of stuff. I find it weird, but also it makes sense at the same time. I asked him about the 5170, about the BIOS thing, and he said the IT guy that he got them from, that was his contact at this bank, remembers when they had to update it because something about the original AT would not accept certain drives and it would not accept certain uh, upgrades. It was, because he said that was one of the original releases of the 5170. And because of that, the BIOS would not accept um, any like RAM expansion cards unless they were IBM ones. And they had problems trying to find them in the mid early, or the early 90s and some drives wouldn't work with it anymore so they had one flat uh burnt that uh eprom burnt that was the 26 uh i think it's a ward bios it's in that now but anyway we're all talking about the 5150 when i asked about the 5150 he kind of laughed and he said that about 2001 2002 these things have been sitting in storage for a few years because he got them and then put them right in storage he wanted to power up make sure they still worked before he put them into storage further he wanted to make sure there's everything was still good he said the 5170 started right up um the 5160 started right up but it didn't boot into anything it just kind of got stuck so he doesn't know what's wrong with the drive um uh, the 5150 though did boot but the hard drive controller started spitting out a bunch of errors and when he opened it up saw that the sticker was messed with on the hard drive now i don't remember it on my when i did the original ibm trio video uh, I'll have to go back and look at my old footage, including footage I never used in the video, in the, the editing. But um, he said that uh, for some reason he had the impression that the Varda battery might have been dead and causing the some of the controller errors, like maybe it lost its time, it needed to have valid CMOS in order to run the card. He said he didn't know, so he checked with a multimeter and 
it was dead. Zero volts. So he said he snipped it off and he stuck it in here just as a, so he knew where it was at. He said that he wouldn't be surprised if there was a piece of electrical tape or something in here from what he stuck it to because he could swear he stuck it to a hard drive here. But uh, I don't see any tape residue so I, it must not have stuck very well. And I don't see a piece of tape in here. So that's the story with it is he cut that off because it just started it was uh basically dead but it might have also just also started to leak because there is a tiny bit of corrosion on this main trace here and we'll have to look at the board but um yeah that's uh get to cleaning some stuff Okay, and now we have the main board here now that these cards are all cleaned. Um, I am looking and I'm seeing on some of these chips here. I don't know exactly what they are. I know these are the BIOS chips, but I don't know if all of them are. Uh, but I do see some corrosion underneath. Oh no, I see corrosion. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pull off all those chips real quick. So maybe that battery was actually leaking more than he thought and yes i know i do not have a proper chip puller okay well that one's not u29 is not too bad i need to make sure i, need to make sure I keep these in order though because i don't want to screw these up there's u30 i do see some tarnishing on the legs but that's not too bad but i do see corrosion and not only that i don't know if you can see it real well right here I think I see a broken pen. Yeah, I think I see a broken pen. Uh-oh. I'm not sure exactly what these uh, what these chips do. Oh God, there's a lot more right there too. And there's even a lot on that. There's even a lot on that on those legs of you. Uh, oh boy. I don't see no corrosion around the chips though. So I wonder if it's just a uh, uh, like like some fluids have this really weird thing where um, when they touch something and they kind of run down they don't like spread out they just like follow like surface tension stuff i don't see yeah there's a tiny bit on u32 i just keep pulling off these chips i need to get an actual chip puller this is not the best way to do it but the good thing is these uh sockets here are i don't know if there's a the right term for this but they're closed like some of the newer ones you buy it's all like open in the middle air section Ooh, that one's fully clean okay so Let's uh, scrub the crap out of these, let them dry, and then um, I may need to grab the dead 5150 board. I'll get some video footage of that and uh, show exactly what's wrong with that board. Because I've already started taking these chips off on that board, and I've already started taking off the BIOS chips on that. So if I need to, I can I can desolder one of the sockets on that board, maybe, and uh, just see if it works. I don't even know what these five chips do. I'll have to look it up on uh, minus zero degrees. I think if I remember correctly though, um, I did do a little bit of uh, preliminary, you know, looking into, that's how I kind of knew about the revision sub or revision three uh, booting from a hard drive, which this thing had. Um, I think these are just the basic ROMs. So I think it would still boot without these chips in, but I don't want to have anything that's going to muck up any diagnostic thing. So I am going to clean these up. I am going to do what I need to to test them. And then we're gonna go from there. We are going to use some vinegar for that just because I want to be able to get rid of any nasties. I'm so glad that I'm basically almost over this. 
my congestion stuff, whatever I've got, because oh, this is It wasn't COVID. I kept thinking it was for a while because I couldn't smell much. But then I kind of remembered that every time I've gotten a sinus infection or thing since COVID, I, I lose my sense of smell like almost instantly. Now that we got uh, all the corrosion and stuff scrubbed off, well, most of it anyway, uh, I got it scrubbed off of U29 and U33 uh, here, and U32, these are fine. Uh, these two in the middle here, 30 and 31, they still have some corrosion deep in the pins, I can see that. Uh, they're, they're missing pins, so these are gonna have to be replaced. That's gonna be part two though, part one was just me cleaning and doing some research on these parts, so um, yeah. I'm gonna hit it with some isopropyl here and get the vinegar off, and then rinse with distilled water and then um, let it fully dry before I do anything for part two. Uh, I need to find the other 5150 board so I can take the sockets off that dead board and use them for this or just see if eBay sells these. I don't know. But um, I did do some research on this for from minus zero degrees.net and uh, I believe from the date code on here and from what I found on minus zero degrees that this is a revision three board. And specifically, I think it's a very late 5150 if not one of the later ones or one of the last ones because of some stuff I had found. Um, first off, this had a hard drive controller in it, which, yes, technically revision two, and I believe uh, Adrian's Digital Basement had a really early revision one that had a hard controller in it, hard drive controller in it too. But um, this is a two, this is a sixty-four two two fifty-six K. This means this is revision two or three. And the real kicker for it being revision three was actually this chip I pulled off um, is actually the BIOS chip that goes right here in U thirty-three. It's got the part number of. 150 which does indicate this is a revision three. In fact, it's got a date code of uh, 23rd week of 83. So this is one of the later uh, revisions of the 5150, meaning this thing can take the full 640K of RAM because I believe the uh, I believe the very first revision could only go up to, I believe, 384K or 512K, I believe, depends on what RAM expansion card you have. And this had a hard drive controller in it which that particular model um, apparently had some, uh, there was a form or something that was mentioned compatibility problems with some of the early revision ones with some hard drive controllers. And I believe that one was on the list of ones that have issues with the earlier PCs. I don't know, I need to see if I can find that form again. It might've just been a passing thing where I misread the form completely. But anyway, um, a lot of the date codes are um, indicative of this being a very late uh, revision board. All of the NEC RAM chips here in Bank Zero do have the date code of 83 on them. Uh, all the Texas Instruments ones in Bank 1 and 2 are from 83. And all the ones, Motorola ones in here, actually have um, the date codes of 84. I'm kind of confused by this because these don't say they're 60 or 4164s. They actually say they are MCM 6665BP20s. So I don't know if that's, you know, what exactly that is. But um, yeah, we do also have the NAC. 8088D up here, which has a date code of 82. No mathematical processor. It's, I'm a little I'm a little bummed by that. Not irritated, but bummed. <clears throat> I'm a little bummed by the no mathematical processor because uh, I haven't yet to come across one. But 8087s are actually superly cheap, uh, so it'd be probably something to pop in here. Plus, I could also probably pop in an NEC V20 and just gain a little bit more power. But considering my plans for this, um, that's not going to be that big a deal. Um, all the caps are intact, so I don't think anyone's powered this thing up since it was put in storage, which means at any moment any of these could pop when I power it up, which is gonna be in part two. Hopefully if everything tests out okay. But yeah, now I just need to find the board, desolder and stuff for part two. But that's uh, future stuff. Part one's just cleaning and research. Okay, and the first card in the stack we're gonna look at that I've done some, that I've cleaned up now is the uh, multi-function card. This is a Diamond Flower, you know, great name for a PC parts company, um, MF100 Revision 8. Um, I could not find, I found the owner's manual and stuff for this, but I'm kind of confused by something and I'll talk about that here in a second. But anyway, much like the ASC six packs and other multi IO cards of the day, we have the RAM expansion here, which uh, is 384K when fully populated, which it is. We have the jumper switch here so we can start at the, um, where the RAM's gonna start filling in. So if you have 256K, you flip the switch to that and then this fills it up to 640, you know, or if you have zero RAM, it'll bump it up to 384. So plus we have the real time clock stuff, which the battery is corroded and cut off. 
Uh, I need to make sure the traces here are good. That'll be part two. Uh, then we have the section for all the expanding uh, ports and such, like the 25 pin serial that's on it and the header for game port and parallel, which I do not have the bracket for or the cables. I don't know if they're, if these pins are universe compatible to where I can just grab one out of like a 36, 46, whatever. So the weird thing about the research on this is I did download the manual and the manual's got a date of like 1988, 1989, which is very strange. Some of the day codes on these RAM chips, if these are day codes, which I don't know if they are or not, but we have 851C, we have 909C, we have 923C, we have, uh, what did I see? I saw it on 924C. Uh, this is kind of weird because that would imply this thing was sold in the 90s or upgraded in the 90s. Uh, specifically, these are KM4164B-12 um, RAM chips. This is fully populated, but a lot of the other codes on here are like this SIS chip has a date code of 89. Um, this chip down here has a date code of 89. It's got a sticker on the back of 89. So that would mean that this 5150 at some point in its life, in the very late 80s, possibly very early 90s, was still in use to the point where they needed to do a RAM upgrade, which is very strange because most of these 5150s had an option for a 256K RAM board to bump it up to 512K. So I don't know if it's just this was needed to kind of consolidate a bunch of other cards they could have put in there, but that would mean that whatever bank was using this thing was still using it in the 90s, a 5150. That is just absolutely outstanding. Uh, if I, if it's all to be believed and true, I do want to read that owner's manual a little bit through and see when the copyright date is, because I could swear it said 87, 88. So um, yeah, that'll be more for a part two thing. The next one is the generic run of the mill floppy controller card. Nothing really much to say here, except I think if I remember correctly, these supported the a very, very original, uh, I think they were single-sided 160K drives, the updated 180K drives, single-sided, and then the double-sided 360K drives, which is, I believe, is the floppy drive that came with this. Uh, but other than that, nothing much to say here. This would not support uh, three and a half inch floppies. There was something on minus zero degrees.net that said something about it would use a three and a half inch floppy, but it would only format it to not 720, but I think it would like still be 360 on a three and a half inch disc would be really weird. Uh, I'm not gonna try that. Um, it's got a date code of 84. So yeah, this is a later revision of it. Kind of neat that uh, all this was consolidated much later and put onto motherboards. The next one is a CMS. Well, for some reason it says CMS here on the BIOS chip. I don't know if that was a custom thing or not, but this is a Western Digital uh, WD1002S dash WX2 MFM controller card. And it's it's actually very clean. A lot of the date codes on this, again, there there's date codes of like 86 uh, and 85 on here. So this thing was put in, well, actually sometime in the late, mid eighties. Um, uh, it, it runs, it's, uh, you know, compatible with a lot of different FF, MFM drives. Uh, pretty compatible one actually, from what I can tell. Um, as long as the hard drive that came with it does work, which I'll show here in a second. Um, but yeah, really, really, a uh, nice thing. In fact, I, I really hope that that hard drive kind of works because it'd, it'd be neat to see one of these in action. Um, but this is another clue that, that this was a revision three because if I remember correctly, this particular card would not work in the original revision of the PC because it had a externally loading BIOS and a ROM, a lo external loading ROM or BIOS, however they want to word it, that the original you know, revision one just did not like. And the final card here that I pulled out of this thing was the video card. And yes, the bracket's still off. I, I have yet to find the nut, the little nuts that go on here. But anyway, this is the NEC MG 160 N revision B. It is a uh, pretty nice Hercules clone card. Um, I actually come across a lot of Hercules clone cards, but yeah, these were actually really neat because it allowed you to upgrade a uh, original 5150 that had MDA graphics to have a uh, single color CGA style graphics because that's kind of what the Hercules was. It combined the crisp clear text of MDA with the capability of running single color uh, CGA style graphics on an MDA monitor without having to upgrade. Um, the neat thing about this is that unlike the MDA cards, this has a 64K of video RAM, which is just, just a lot for what it is. But um, yeah, nice little clone card, uh, very compact parallel card. So it does add some functionality on top of the multi-IO card. So yeah, this is something I might actually put back in, or I might actually use uh, the MDA card that came with my other Junk 5150. Uh, just to make sure everything works there. So um, yeah, speaking of hard drives, this is the one that I pulled out of this unit. Uh, this is the ST213. I have not, I haven't heard of too many 
NFM drive number, so I can't name them all by, you know, my name. I do not recognize the 213. I know it's part of the ST2X series, which were really, really compatible, like, and really well liked, like the ST225. That seems to be everywhere, but a uh, really nice hard drive. We have a date code of March 17th of 1987. So this was put in this thing very, very late into uh, this thing's lifespan. But yeah, really nice half height drive, really clean. Uh, my only concern is the warranty sticker has been ripped like somebody's been in here, which does make a little bit of sense because a, if this thing, this thing came from a bank, and the gentleman I got this from, um, I don't know if I mentioned it before, uh, it's, been, it's been a while since I recorded the teardown video, obviously. But, um, and the fact that this one had, was taken apart, um, he, Kind of when I mentioned it, he kind of said, "Yeah, I do remember the guy said something about he took the cover off one of the drives because when he powered it up before he took possession of it, um, it did not spin up or anything. So it's possible this drive is locked up and dead. So um, it still looks neat, and it'd probably be a neat thing to maybe put back in the PC if I could find the half height uh, adapter that the the bay cover." But I'm not gonna hold my breath on it. Um, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, you know, not 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 anything. It's just be really neat to look on a shelf. And the final thing, part of the PC was uh, <laughs> the floppy drive, the much needed floppy drive, because early computers you could not use anything except for floppies. Uh, it's got some, like I said, it's got some audit stickers on it. But anyway, this is a Tadrin Tandon. I oh my god, I mispronounced that earlier, didn't I? Tandon uh, drive. Uh, I don't see a model number, uh, TM100-2A, with a date code of 1983. So this is probably the original drive that came with it, the original A drive. Uh, I have not cleaned or restored this thing yet or lubed anything up because uh, I kind of want to do that in part two. I want to fully tear it apart, control board, lube the slides up and all that stuff in part two. Um, I mean, yeah, that spins free, but I want to make sure the... Uh, main mechanism slides and the reed heads all nice and clean and that's going to be in part two because i knew that's just something that's just something i want to do in part two so uh yeah if i looked up this correctly so i believe this is the uh double-sided uh double density uh 360k uh floppy drive so it does make it that does make it better in a lot of ways because writing a 360k five and a quarter floppy is a little bit easier than uh trying to write a 180k uh, floppy or even a 160k. Um, I think I believe that this disc and the controller are compatible of writing them. So if I could somehow get a uh, a disc image on like a CF card to an XT uh, to CF adapter, which this thing should boot from, onto that, and then I should be able to write the appropriate DOS floppy using this, like piece like PC DOS 1.0 or 2.0 or whatever, or you know whatever the case may be. But like I said, um, this is going to be cleaned up in part two and fully refreshed in part two. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and end the uh, first part of the 5150 restoration video uh, right here for a few reasons anyway. The big reason is that I really don't know how long or short this video is going to end up being. Uh, mainly due to the fact that um, I have a lot of footage I got to sort through and organize. Um, not a lot of long video clips but a lot of short itty bitty little uh, snippet clips that's in my ingest folder on my computer, like almost two dozen. Uh, and, the, and the main reason for that is um, I started recording this in early June when I was getting sick and I just assumed, oh, it's just something minor, like a summer cold allergies thing. You know, I can muscle through it. I've done it before. Unfortunately, um, that first part, I was suffering really bad. I was having a uh, kind of a headache from my light here. Uh, my throat was hurting, but it wasn't like sore it was just hurting um and i was constantly sniffling all the time from my runny nose so <laughs> unfortunately with that me being sick um plus work schedule stuff and pretty severe weather in the area i just have not had a chance to get down here for more than a couple minutes at a time to uh really record any footage for this so it's all just been snippety you know come home from work record something for a few minutes go back to work and that kind of stuff so i need to sort through all that video footage uh make sure the audio and video is good uh go from there and then also edit out a bunch of the uh repeating rambling stuff that i am prone to do when i record things over the course of days and weeks i have a really bad habit like where um i'll forget where i am in the script so the first day i'll record something and say this and the next and then a couple days later i'll go to record this i forget i said this 
so then I'll just keep reading it and repeat everything from the first part so that I have to figure out, okay, where, wait, where do I need to end here? Where do I need to end here? It, oh, it's a bad habit I need to get out of, but um, like mark down where I've written in my script. Part one here was mainly about uh, talking about this particular machine uh, from some of the history that I'd gotten from the gentleman that I had gotten it from, that he could remember, um, tearing it all the way completely apart, doing some very deep cleaning on a lot of the internal cards and parts. Um, being very thorough with a lot of the um, cleaning that I was doing, a lot of the teardown, and a lot of the information that I was putting out, uh, unlike my 5150 video, or 5170 video that I kind of rushed through. Um, and then getting a game plan going for what part two is gonna be. And um, it's looking like part two is gonna be a big video. The main thing is doing some solder work to this board here. It's not major soldering, it's just gonna be really tedious because I need to, um, well, first off, I need to buy a desoldering pump so I can desolder these bad sockets here. And I either need to order new sockets or I need to find that other 5150 board and take its sockets, which I haven't found it yet. It's somewhere in my computer room, but it's currently a mess right now from stuff that happened. So I need to dig through stuff and find it. And then also definitely wanna order some caps for this because I'm pretty sure that they're gonna need to be replaced. I also need to, Test the power supply outputs, make sure all the rails are right. Um, make sure there's no, take it, take it apart and clean everything inside, clean the fan. Make sure all the connection's good. Make sure there's no burnt traces anywhere in the power supply. Uh, do some work on that IO card because I really don't know if any traces are bad. So I need to ohm stuff out. Tear apart and scrub the floppy drive and then scrub the crap out of the top case. The reason why I didn't clean on this video was because with me not having time to set aside to actually scrub it, I didn't want to spray some sort of cleaner on it and then get pulled away and uh, have something happen to the paint or the plastics. So uh, that's the reason for that. So yeah, part two is gonna be a really big video uh, and I am looking forward to it. So uh, I just gotta get some stuff for that video to get going. So that being said, thank you all for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any thoughts or comments about the IB150-150 here, maybe you've restored one, used one, had a little more information about it. Um, if I was incorrect about anything I talked about with any of the hardware or the parts or the revision, or anything, uh, please put it down in the comments so I can correct it in part two. If it all works in part two, if you have any uh, games or software you wanna see me try and run on a, uh, well, at minimum 256K 8088 powered system, because I don't know if that RAM card is gonna work or the hard drive is gonna work, um, put it down in the comments because I'll love to test it out in all its Hercules glory. So uh, <laughs> again, thank you all for watching. I'll see you on the next video.